Hey, this is Dr. Ron, and I'm super, super excited to you, uh, for, to introduce you guys to uh, Chris Wark. And he is uh, he's a phenomenal guy. I'm going to let him introduce himself and let him tell you a very inspirational story, one that has inspired me and a lot of my friends and my patients uh, are on his website literally every single day looking for a lot of cool information about cancer and anti-cancer diets, right? And so, yeah, why don't you start introducing yourself? Thanks, Dr. Ron, man. It's great to connect, and I appreciate you taking mm -hmm. the time to interview me and um, let me share my story and talk about my new book, which is, just hold it up. Here it is, Chris Beat Cancer, Comprehensive awesome. Plan for Healing Naturally, published by Hay House uh, on September 25th. So it's only just been out for a few days now, and uh, it's number three on Amazon right now. People wow. are going crazy about this book, which is so exciting. So I was um, diagnosed with stage three colon cancer when I was 26. I was having abdominal pain. I went to the doctor several times. I couldn't figure it out. They finally did a colonoscopy and found a golf ball sized tumor in my large intestine on the right side of my colon. And I was a very typical cancer patient. And when I say typical, I mean clueless, okay? <laughs> Most cancer patients have no idea I have no clue about cancer, no clue about cancer treatment. I'd never had any friends or family go through it. I really didn't know anything. But I was told after the biopsy came back, you know, you have colon cancer and you need to do surgery right away. We needed to get this thing out of you uh, before it spreads and kills you. And so I was like, well, okay, you know, whatever, whatever you say, doc, right? Just, I just don't want to die. So um, this was two days before Christmas and... <laughs> You know, it was obviously just terrible news, devastating news. Uh, I was, again, 26 and just was the last thing I ever would have expected a doctor to tell me. Mm -hmm. And I was able to delay the surgery um, until after Christmas. They wanted to get me in right before Christmas, you know, right away. And I was managed to postpone the treatment, went in on December 30th. Uh, so it's a little bit over a week later. They took out a third of my large intestine, took out the tumor, they saw during the surgery uh, that it had spread to several lymph nodes. So we took out a bunch of lymph nodes to an attempt to get clear margins. When I woke up, they said, well, it's worse than we thought. We were thinking you were probably stage two, which is curable with surgery in a lot of cases, but you're stage three, it spread to your lymph nodes. You're going to need nine to 12 months of chemotherapy. Gosh. So I'm like, oh man, like, you know, it, that was the first time I had started to imagine what it would be like to go through chemotherapy, mm -hmm. right? To become not just a cancer patient, but a chemo patient. And I initially accepted that like, okay, I mean, this is my life. This is m my future. And uh, okay, right? I don't know what else to do. And I guess that's what I have to do. Mm -hmm. But there's a couple things that happened in the hospital that got me thinking a little bit differently. The first meal that they served me after cutting out a third of my large intestine, do you know what it was, Dr. Ron? I'm going to guess pancakes or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that, that would have been actually pretty good. I would have liked that. Uh, they, they brought me a sloppy joe, which anybody watching this probably would agree. Uh, sloppy joe is, is the worst example of cafeteria food right? Maybe besides meatloaf, right? Meatloaf, sloppy joe. I mean, restaurants don't serve them because <laughs> nobody true. likes them. That's true. Right? I mean, the only place you can get a sloppy joe is summer camp, right? <laughs> the military <laughs> and prison, <laughs> right? And then awesome. apparently, yeah, apparently also in the hospital, if you right. have cancer. <laughs> right. And, and the, the, the craziest irony of all is that, you know, red meat is a group two carcinogen. It's connected to, uh, specifically um, linked to colon cancer. And the first meal they served me after colon cancer surgery, red meat. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, you just can't make this stuff up. So I didn't know any of that at the time, right? I just knew they put a sloppy joe in front of me and I was like, oh my God, like why? Why are they serving this kind of food to people in the hospital? Like this is, I had heard that hospital food was bad, but like, man, I don't know, it was this bad. Mm -hmm. The other thing that happened was the day I was supposed to check out, uh, I mean, the day they were letting me go home, is uh, the surgeon came in, we were, he was having his final, doing his rounds, checking on me, 
And I said, hey, is there any food I need to avoid? Because instinctively, I wanted to help myself, right? I didn't want to do anything that would make it, make it worse. And he said, no, just don't lift anything heavier than a beer. Heavier than a beer. <laughs> that was like his little joke, right, yeah. that he probably told everybody. <laughs> yeah. and, and basically was giving me permission to just go home and eat whatever I want, right? Oh, what you eat doesn't matter, right? Your diet doesn't affect your digestive health. And so, yeah, no, doesn't matter. Just don't lift anything heavy. Uh -huh. So, you know, I'm like, okay. I mean, it just, I was expecting more, right? I, I didn't know what he was going to say, but I just thought maybe he would say like, oh yeah, no, you should probably eat more of these kind of foods and stay away from those, right? Right. So I go home, I'm recovering from surgery. I'm on, you know, taking pain pills, sleeping on the couch. So it was easier to get, uh, all, you know, up and down off the couch, then the bed. And as I started to sober up over the, those few days uh, and just kind of wean myself off the pain medicine because I just didn't like being on it, uh, little did I know that morphine-based painkillers can promote metastasis. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, a, that's huge, right? And so how many cancer patients are put on morphine pain pills? I didn't know that, but my, you know, my instincts were like, get off of this, get off of this, you know? wasn't the kind of pain medicine that made you feel good. It just made me feel weird. So anyway, um, I started thinking about my life and my future and I started thinking about chemotherapy. And, and again, at this time in my life, I've always been very instinctively driven. Mm -hmm. and, and so I didn't have any information to go on. I didn't have any personal experience with cancer, right? All I had was very limited, very, very tiny, limited amount of information. And I had my instincts and and I was just thinking, I, you know, the idea of chemotherapy helping me, uh, it was hard for me to wrap my brain around because I knew I was sick. I knew I was weak. I knew I was vulnerable. I was really skinny. I mean, I'm thin anyway, but I was like, you know, probably six, I was six two, but I was probably in the one forties at that time, maybe one forty five. And, um, and I just, something inside me was like, don't do chemo, mm -hmm. right? It's like, man, I don't tell people not to do it. That's not my mission or whatever. But for me, something about it, I had this like little gut check about it, right? That it was like, it, that for me, it wasn't, it was going to be make, uh, it was going to do more harm than good. That was my instinct. So, but I didn't know what else to do. And, I, and my, my wife and I prayed about it. And I was just like, God, you know, if there's another way, besides chemotherapy, will you just show me, mm -hmm. right? Just, just ask for help, right? Need some help here. <laughs> and um, two days later, I got a book that was sent to me from a man who knew my dad. And this guy lived in Alaska. I was in, I'm in Memphis, Tennessee. And I get this book and I start reading it. And the guy who wrote the book uh, had healed his own colon cancer with nutrition and didn't even have surgery. And he'd, he was still alive and had been like 25, 30 years. And I started reading it. I, man, I just, I was, you know, one to two chapters in and I was like, this is the answer to my prayer. Mm -hmm. This is it. Like it, the light bulb went off and the, the, I had the multiple epiphanies just I, happening at once. And, and the big one at first was the way I'm living is killing me. Mm -hmm. And no one had ever told me, and I've learned so much since then, no one had ever told me that the majority of cancers are caused by diet, lifestyle, and environment. And we know now, thanks to multiple studies, that up to 95% of cancers are caused by diet, lifestyle, and environment. And only roughly 5% are genetic. And so I'm like, wait a second. If my diet and lifestyle and environmental factors contributed to my disease or caused my disease, what would happen if I change my diet? What would happen if I change my life and start like focusing on hardcore, healthy living? And so uh, I got really excited about that idea. I got excited about taking control of my situation and changing my whole life because up to that point, I just felt like a victim. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest, one of the other big problems that cancer patients face is one, they're rushed into treatment and two, almost all of them ask their doctors, like, why, why do you think I got cancer? Like, what, what caused this? And many times they're told by their doctor, uh, well, you know, we, we really don't know. It's, you know, probably just bad luck or genetics. Mm -hmm. 
And unfortunately, when a doctor tells a patient it's bad luck or genetics, what he do, what he's saying underneath the surface, right, the underlying message is nothing you did contributed to your disease. Therefore, there's nothing you can do to help yourself except show up for treatment, right? And the but, other thing is, you know, we don't necessarily get training uh, on really the, the food side of the medicine. And there's a lot of physiology that goes into that as well, you know. But uh, as you said before, this is not applicable to the, to the hereditary type of cancer like Lynn syndrome or uh, yeah, hereditary non-polyposis coli. Uh, so this is applicable to, to, the, to the most of the population who have some sort of, I call it acquired cancer, right? And so you were saying that, you know, even narcotics can, can possibly promote the, the spread of metastases. Well, that's probably due to decreased transit time of stool through the colon. And that causes a lot of uh, colonic inflammation and ultimately uh, lymphocytic deactivation so that the, uh, the viruses and the fungi and the bacteria start to not behave very well, which causes more inflammation, which can promote metastases. So you're, you're absolutely right on that. And so yeah. I think in the conventional you know, medicine, uh, it's, it's a struggle. It is a struggle. And I think there's multiple areas that needs to be improved. Uh, but I'll tell you, you know, food and discussing food is not necessarily a huge part of it. And trust me, it's something that the doctors really want to know about, but it's not a big part of the education or any part of the education in most instances. That's slowly starting to change these days. I'll tell you that. My sister's in Columbia Medical School. She's learning some stuff that I never learned in medical school uh, that I'm very happy for uh, looking at the underlying causes of disease. Um, but and uh, the, the 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 other factor I think that oncologists and and, uh, and colorectal surgeons and gastroenterologists are really afraid of is that if the, and, and I want you to address this point is that if me as a doctor tell you that oh there's this this and this and this and this these foods are associated with cancers the fear the fear from the doctor's side which I believe is is very valid is that the patient will stop eating these things and then understanding that this patient might go through chemotherapy and lose weight. They don't necessarily want them to lose too much weight, right? I think it's a valid point, but there's some stipulations in there. Can, can you just kind of explain that? Oh, it's, it's a multifaceted problem. Um, doctors aren't really trained in nutrition. And so a lot of them are kind of in a bubble where they don't really think, if they didn't teach me this in medical school, it must not matter right? It must not be that important. Like what they taught me in medical school is the most important. Everything else, eh. So, <clears throat> so that's problem number one. And then, and then when the patient is saying like, you know, what can I do or what do I need to do? The doctor doesn't have a frame of reference to give them good advice. And then them being worried about them losing weight. So unfortunately, it's, it's swung too far in the wrong direction. So because they don't have any nutritional training, they're saying, we want you to eat high calorie food. We want you, and they, they'll send patients home with a list of foods they recommend they eat during chemo, which includes ice cream, yogurt, pizza, cottage cheese, shakes, milkshakes, high calorie food, junk food, and cancer promoting food. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, so you've got a patient that thinks there's nothing they can do to help themselves. And then they're given permission to go home and eat all the junk food they want, which they love that, right? Who doesn't love permission from their doctor to eat ice cream, right? Well, my doctor said I can eat ice cream, right? I've heard that many times. So, you know, I don't, I, I don't need to change my diet. My doctor said I can eat whatever I want. Right. So that's a problem, right? And, um, and it, it compounds the problem. So what patients need to know first and foremost, is that there are, there's so much evidence, and doctors need to know it too. You know it. There's so much published evidence on the power of nutrition to prevent and reverse disease, to improve outcomes, to improve, to reduce the side effects of treatment, to uh, increase longevity, improve survival, uh, decrease risk of recurrence, right? Fruits and vegetables are amazing. They're so good for you. <laughs> so there I was, right? in this system, one, looking for answers and said, you know, ask for help. This book shows up and I'm like, okay, this guy did a, he, he converted to a raw food diet and healed his cancer. And I'm thinking, man, that is radical. 
that, I mean, what would happen to my body if I stopped eating burgers and fries and milkshakes? I've always been thin, so I could eat whatever I wanted, right? Barbecue sandwiches, Dr. Pepper, like what would happen if I stopped eating all this processed food, fast food, junk food, and tons of meat and dairy every day, and it went back to nature and just ate fruits and vegetables? Straight out of the earth, organic, you know, unadulterated food from the earth. And, uh, and also started juicing. And so I got excited. I was like, I'm doing it. This is what I'm doing. I'm radically changing my life. I'm changing my diet. I'm starting right now. And unfortunately, most of the people around me thought I'd lost my mind <laughs> and told me, don't do that. That's a mistake. Like, like you've got to do exactly what the doctor says. Don't you think that if, they, if there was something better, they would know about it? They would tell you about it? Why don't you, will you please just go see the oncologist and see and, and hear what they have to say? Because, you know, maybe they, maybe they know about these things. Maybe they can help you. So I'm like, okay, okay. I go see the oncologist and, and the, the appointment did not go well. He told me I had a 60% chance of living five years with treatment, which was a, a, it was a lie. But he took, that's the average of all cancer patients, all types, all stages. It's like 60%. Uh, and he told me that to try to make me feel better about treatment. And I, but I still was thinking, uh, 60%, that's kind of low. That's like kind of close to 50%, which is like a coin toss, which makes me you know, not feeling very optimistic about treatment. They wanted to give me um, fluorocell, 5-FU, and leucovorin, mm -hmm. which of course... Um, fluorocell is uh, the nickname for that. A five FU is five feet under. It doesn't make you feel <laughs> real good about that drug. Uh, the only drug with the worst nickname would be a doxorubicin, which they call Red Devil or Red Death. But anyway, um, and I asked him about if were there are there any alternative therapies available, and he said no. If you don't do chemotherapy, you're insane. And the rest of the appointment, the, of our appointment, he spent trying to talk me into chemotherapy and scare me into chemotherapy and tell, basically telling me, if you don't do what I say, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. And it, it, did, it was just did not go well. And I, my wife and I left that appointment terrified, discouraged, depressed, I mean, really feeling hopeless. And that's the other problem that's happening in cancer clinics all over the world is that it's a lot of them are just fear factories, right? They're just so much fear and patients are making fear-based decisions instead of fact-based decisions or faith-based decisions. I created a, a free guide for cancer patients called 20 questions for your oncologist. And it's, they're, they're very straightforward questions, but they're very pointed questions about the treatments, the stage of disease, like the, uh, the likelihood of survival and permanent remission and things like that, that a patient needs to ask because I didn't know the right questions to ask. Mm -hmm. And if you don't ask the right questions, you're not going to get the right answers and you're going to make a decision based on fear. So in a lot of this, I talk about another book plug in my new book, right? I talk, tell my story and kind of talk about that journey, um, sort of nav navigating treatment. But I went home and I was fortunate to have a few weeks to recover. I was still recovering from surgery. I'd been on a raw food diet for a week. I was feeling good. Like I was really feeling good. And I was, despite that really difficult day, um, I just went home from that appointment and just fired up the juicer, right? And like, just, just keep doing what I'm doing. And then the next day I had an appointment with a naturopathic doctor who was also a clinical nutritionist and a master herbalist. And that appointment was completely different. It, you know, he encouraged me. He said, you're doing the right thing. Uh, and was the first person really to tell me I was doing the right thing. And for, he connected me with another MD who was an integrative MD who had come out of retirement, uh, had spent his whole life as an oncologist, retired, didn't like being retired, went back to work and started studying Chinese medicine. And I uh, started researching and integrating um, non-toxic therapies into his practice, like IV vitamin C mm -hmm. and some other things. And, uh, and from there, uh, when the day came to get the port put in, because I had agreed to it, I, you know, when I went to that appointment, they scared me into chemo, right? And so I, I was like, okay, I made an appointment to get a port. But when that day came, you know, I woke up and I was like, this is not right for me right now. Mm -hmm. It's not right for me right now. 
what I want to do right now, and this is my, what I, the, my thought process was, I want to build my body up. I want to repair it. I want to restore it. I want to give it as much nutrition and fuel and firepower that it can use to heal, right? It was this holistic thinking of like, I want to overdose on nutrition, give my body an abundance of vitamins, minerals, enzymes, antioxidants, and all these wonderful anti-cancer compounds and fruits and vegetables. And I want to give it all of this good stuff, let it use what it needs and change my life and see what happens, right? So it's taking my life into my own hands and chemotherapy was just kind of like, for me, it was kind of on the back burner, right? It's like, okay, I know that's there. I know that's what they want me to do. I'm going to do this first because I just don't feel physically ready for, for those treatments. I felt like they were just going to destroy me. So, uh, so I put it on the back burner, you know, and postponed it and just got busy just eating massive amounts of fruits and vegetables every day. I went from eating one to two servings of fruits or vegetables per day, right? The standard American diet. I think that's more than the standard American diet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. You yeah. know, like, okay, does a banana, I had a banana today. Is that, that's pretty good, right? I had some, uh, I had some lettuce and tomato on my double cheeseburger. Right. So I got some there. So anyway, I went from, yeah, eating almost no real food, fresh produce, to eating between 15 and 20 servings of fruits and vegetables every day. Mm -hmm. Dude, I was just overdosing on it, right? In a good way. Overdose, sound, it sounds like a negative term, but for me, it was like, you know, I was just thinking, just pump it in there. And right. that's three, you know, three big meals, right? A breakfast, I, I did a lot of juicing. So some days I would juice through breakfast, carrot juice, carrot beet, apple, celery, ginger root, stuff like that. And then lunch, giant salad. And I was eating what I learned later from research was I was eating the most potent anti-cancer vegetables. I don't even realize it, but that's the cruciferous family and the allium family. So broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, and then the allium family, garlic and onions, mm -hmm. leeks too, but I didn't eat any leeks at the time. I didn't, I didn't know how good they were. Mm -hmm. But a giant bowl full of veggies with apple cider vinegar, garlic powder, turmeric powder, curry powder, oregano, Bragg sprinkle, which is a bunch of herbs, and a uh, little little olive oil and apple cider vinegar, which I just said, and a little bit of sauerkraut, fermented food. And it was delicious. I was like, man, this is so good. I'm just going to eat this every single day for lunch and dinner. Mm -hmm. Right? So I just really r simplified my strategy to okay. hardcore anti-cancer vegetables every single day. I'm just going to keep pumping these in. And, and I would put nuts on there. I would put um, sprouted beans on there, like sprouted lentils or garbanzo beans. I would put avocado on there some days when I had it. And um, it was a big, delicious salad. And it made me so happy. It filled me up, excuse me, filled me up, gave me energy. And um, I was like, this is it. I'm just going to do this every single day. And I'm going to juice throughout the day. And then I started incorporating fruit smoothies because berries are the most potent, potent anti-cancer fruits. So blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, and a banana. Throw it in the blender with some water and you're, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> those three, you know, it's two salads, a fruit smoothie and fresh vegetable juices all day. And man, oh man, I was pumping in the fruits and vegetables. And so once I got that dialed in, it was like, all right, now I just got to just rinse and repeat, just do this every single day. So I made it really simple, really sustainable. And I just kept doing it. And then working with the doctor, they did vitamin C IV therapy for me, checked my blood work every month, did some CT scans every six months for the first couple of years. And the big goal was to prevent the recurrence. Because when I was told, look, you're, you're a young adult, you have stage 3C colon cancer, it's really aggressive in young adults. If you don't do chemotherapy, it's, it's kind of going to come back. It's going to your liver. You're, it's the next place you're going to find it's in your liver. Mm -hmm. Cancer's growing in my body. Something is wrong. Mm -hmm. And the holistic approach to cancer is they look at it as something that the body created and can heal, right? It's your cells. It's your DNA. Your body created it. Your body can heal it, but there's something, there are causes, there are factors that are causing this cancer and that are contributing to its growth. And so we need to address those causes, change the internal terrain, make your body a place where cancer cannot thrive. So that's what I was doing, right? I was changing my body because your body's made out of what you put in your mouth. Right. You are what you ate. And so I was just laser focused 
on rebuilding my body. People think about bodybuilding as like the gym, right? But mm -hmm. the truth is you're building your body every single day. It's a perpetual construction site. I mean, your journey is one that we hear a lot in my practice just because we do a lot of the, uh, the integrative approaches towards uh, cancer therapy. And so, um, but you know, 10 people can have the same colon cancer that you've had for 10 completely different reasons, right? And the idea is for your body to um, be a place where cancer can no longer survive. So, um, you know, whether it be viral or heavy metal toxicity or um, some underlying uh, hidden infection that's causing the cancer cells to, to uh, divide. But or bacon. Yeah, yeah. And so and something, something in the environment is telling that those specific cells to continue dividing. There's, there's a, in the genetic sequence of each cell, there's, a, there's something called a stop codon. And a stop codon basically tells the cells to stop dividing. And when something is bound to that stop codon, the transcription jumps over, it continues to divide. So something's causing that stop codon to, to, to not to be there. And so in most cancers, and this, out, this is outside of hereditary cancers, obviously, but for most cancers, um, there is something, uh, you know, at the root of every cancer is some sort of toxins that we just have to find. And usually there's multiple ones, right? And so by eating those, um, those vegetables, you're getting increased fiber. Uh, by eating um, a lot of those phytonutrients, you're increasing um, uh, basically the, 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 the cleanup crew uh, in your immune system in the phase called autophagy. And you're also increasing your circulating stem cells. And these are the cells that will make a new tissue uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the ones that are damaged. And these are the processes that really are needed to, um, to stop this, whatever's binding to that stop codon to lift off and say, hey, I can stop dividing now. And so the, the concept of, of cancer has to be one, that's, that's a multifactorial approach. You gotta hit things in parallel, just like you said. It's not a linear pattern. And so, you know, one thing that you said earlier really struck me um, is that when a lot of people go in and they get diagnosed, they feel like helpless, right? Like, well, there's not much I can do, so I'm gonna eat this, you know, uh, ice cream and everything like that. Uh, but some people are already uh, in the stages where they're just super weak. And the last thing their doctor wants to do is tell them to stop eating certain foods. But what I don't, I don't think most people realize is that even if you do like an imminent fasting or prolonged fast, you actually don't lose any lean muscle mass. <laughs> um, to uh, And that will ultimately help you with this regeneration of tissue, right? And also when you're, in, when you're not consuming meat and when you're consuming all these vegetables, I think a lot of people have a misconception that these vegetables are what we call empty calories, meaning that they're just there, they're not really calories to support you. But, um, but I think this is the mindset of everyone being so obsessed with macros, they're ignoring their micros, right? They're ignoring the vitamin B5s and anthocyanin that's in purple vegetables and stuff like that, right? They're ignoring all that because like, oh, because of this carb to fat to, to, um, to protein ratio, I'm not supposed to be eating this, but in the, in the top of, of, of cancer and ultimately hoping to reverse cancer physiology, what we want to do is make sure all the micronutrients in there, and that's where all the sloppy joes aren't going to do a good job, um, but you know, your, your Brussels sprouts and asparagus and everything like it with a lot of sulforaphanes is going to do well. And also these sulforaphanes are actually precursors for your liver to bind to toxins and detoxify. And one of those toxins may actually be the thing that, 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 um, that binds that stop code on so the cancer keeps proliferating. You may not know which one, but you can arm your body with these sulforaphane vegetables, right, with these things, the plant-based vegetables, to combat these things in hopes that there might be better phys physiology for your body. Now, some people are too far along for this to happen, but uh, for a lot of people, uh, it still applies, right? And so I'm really glad you're, uh, you're, you're putting this book out on your side. It's always good for me as a physician to, to hear uh, people on the patient side going through the journey and talk about the emotionality of it, right? But one thing I want you to focus on also um, is something that we don't talk about in the medical industry as much as we should, and is, is the mindset of beating cancer and also stress and how stress plays a big role. So would love to. So nutrition, a plant-based diet, tons of fruits and vegetables, like you said, um, 
do so much good in the body. I mean, it's really almost incalculable. We know things scientifically that they do, but there's a lot of things we don't know that they do. Right. And But flipping those genetic switches, uh, those cancer-promoting genes, flipping them, turning them off is one amazing thing they do. In, uh, decreasing inflammation, uh, improving immune function, improving detoxification, like those are all wonderful things that fruits and vegetables do in your body. And so anyway, but that's one piece of the puzzle. That's one part. It's got to be there. It's a foundation for sure. But the there's a spirit, mind, body connection to health and disease. And I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of cancer patients in almost 15 years. And they all had two things in common. When I ask them, like, why do you think you got cancer? They'll say, well, I haven't been taking care of myself. So <clears throat> the stress conversation is really fascinating because stress, and for anybody that thinks about stress uh, or doesn't understand what stress is, right? We can feel it, but it's hard to articulate. So I figured out how to articulate what stress is. Stress is all negative um, thought and emotion. So envy, jealousy, um, crit being critical and judgmental of others, insecurity, um, bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, shame and guilt, right? All of those negative emotions, thought, yeah. negative thoughts and emotions produce stress in your mind, which translates to stress in your body. So for example, if, you, if you're going through life day to day in a very stressful job where there's tons of pressure, tons of demands, unhealthy work environment, you know, coworkers or bosses that are just awful, right? You're, you're going to be in a state of chronic stress. And when you're in, in that chronic stress situation, your body starts pumping uh, adrenaline and cortisol more than you would normally have if you were relaxed. And those hormones... Uh, can do some good in the body, but they can also do some bad things in the body, which is increase inflammation and decrease immune function. So when you're living in a state of chronic stress, whether it's work or a dysfunctional relationship, right, or money problems, or you're, you know, just making bad decisions, uh, then you're also in a state that um, sets your body up for chronic disease, which may or may not be cancer. It could be uh, lots of chronic diseases that come as a result of chronic inflammation and decreased immune function, but we're talking about cancer. So, so stress has to be addressed. And uh, it kind of, there's a few things that I did and I talk about this in the book. Again, a big, big book plug, Chris beat cancer, get it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere books are sold. It's out right now. Um, but what I had to do is I first had to figure out, I had to change my thoughts like I had to catch myself because I was a very critical, negative, judgmental person. I was very insecure. I was unhappy in, in my core. Uh, I was, um, I had a chip on my shoulder. I was competitive and, and couldn't stand when anyone else was successful, right? Just envious and jealous of others. And I had to start catching myself. Anytime these negative thoughts would just pop in my head, I had to be like, wait a minute. Like I'm being critical. I'm being judgmental. I'm being envious. Like I'm like, I need to stop. Like I don't have to think that way. And instead I'll just be like, no, I'm not going to be jealous of that person. That's I'm going to be happy for them. Right. And so now there's a term for it called mindfulness. Which I, didn't, I hadn't heard that term back in 2004, but anyway, it's mindful. This not mindfulness means like catching your thoughts, like paying attention to your thoughts, because you are not your thoughts. You choose your thoughts. And so I had to retrain my brain, retrain it to think positively, to look for the positives in every situation. And what I also learned, and I had some, you know, major epiphanies in my life through the cancer process, so many, um, but I, I realized that obstacles come into your life for a reason. And it's usually one of two reasons. It's either they come into your life for you to overcome them or they come into your life to divert you onto a new path. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes overcoming them is a, it becomes a new path for you. But uh, when you look at an obstacle from that perspective, like, okay, this problem in my life is here for a reason sure. and there's a good thing on the other side of this right? This bad thing is going to become something good in my life. I don't know what it is and I don't like it, right? You don't mm -hmm. have to like it. But when I started to think, you know, something good is going to come out of this. 
And I, there's a verse in the Bible that says, God works all things for the good of those who love him. So I, I just right in the beginning of my cancer journey, I was like, I'm just going to believe that. I'm just going to believe that God's going to work this for my good somehow. And p- please don't let me die. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, uh, so, I, so that's where it started, right? It started with my thoughts. And then once I, st- you know, kind of got a hold of that, and this is a di- this is a daily practice. It's a discipline. You can't just immediately start thinking differently. Like you have to fight those negative thoughts and and one by one, like flip them to positive. But uh, anyway, this thing about stress and and bitterness and negativity and unforgiveness, like it, I just kept, you know, learning from other people, and they kept bringing it up, and I kept thinking, no, that's I, that's not me. I, that's not my problem. But eventually I was like, okay, I don't want to make sure, I don't want to miss anything. Mm-hmm. So maybe, maybe this could be part of my problem, right? I didn't want to look in the mirror. I didn't want to admit I had any faults or flaws, right? <laughs> or failures like so many of us. But once I finally just said, okay, let me just think about who I am, how I am. And my, let me think about my past, what I've been through. I realized, yeah. I need to just start forgiving people, you know? And the thing is, I don't have a traumatic childhood story. My parents stayed married. I wasn't abused. You know, no girls really broke my heart. Like, you know, I didn't have I, none of my best friend. There were some kids that died that I knew that was pretty sad, but I didn't like lose a best friend or anything or a sibling or didn't even have any close family members die. But mm-hmm. yet I had still let myself become insecure and let little in, insults and injuries build up. Right. And I had, and I had let them sort of corrupt me and make me really judgmental and critical of others. So I just decided I'm going to forgive everybody. So one by one, I would I just sit down and get in a prayerful state and just think about people in my life and my past that had hurt me. And one by one, I just say, OK, God. All right. You know what they did. You know how I feel about it. Uh, I'm still mad about it. Like it still makes me, it still hurts, but mm-hmm. I'm choosing to forgive them. And I'm letting it go. Not easy. Uh, what? It's not easy. It's not easy, right? It's not easy, but I just, you just got to make the decision, right? right? Forgiveness is not a feeling, it's choice. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, I'm choosing right now. I'm forgiving, I'm letting them go, and they're all yours, right? It's like, okay, God, they're all yours. You can deal with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm just, I'm not going to hold this. I'm not going to carry it anymore. Letting go of the bitterness, the resentments. And all that, and and really, the most powerful little part of this prayer is the part at the end where I said, and where you say, and I'm asking you to bless them, one by one. I just started forgiving people, just letting them go, letting them go. And man, the the burden just like lifted off of me, right? It's just, it, you just feel so much lighter when you just let things go, and ask God to forgive them. And and you know what happens too that. That's really what heals your heart. Your emotions, your feelings, all that stuff changes after you make the decision to forgive, not before. And your genetic expression also changes, by the way, right? Yes. Which affects well, cancer growth and everything like that. It's, it's very powerful. There are, there are profound effects in the body caused by anger bitterness, resentment, right? Caused by these negative emotions, caused by stress, profound effects, negative effects, disease promoting effects. And there are profound health promoting effects when you let them go. And when you choose love and joy and gratitude, and you choose to think positively instead of negatively, man, it's amazing. And you know, so it's not just about food and choices. No, it's and, about and, the mindset and the ability to forgive, and which are choices, though. But those are choices. Ah, uh, yeah, that's true. That is that is a lifestyle choice. Yeah, it's um, a lifestyle choice. And if that's you look, at, really you know, the hardest part. Yeah. I think we can all we all know older people, mm-hmm. and if you go in a nursing home, there's two types of old people. There's the old people that are really negative and cynical and unhappy, right? Because they've led in their whole life, that's, they've entertained those thoughts and emotions, mm-hmm. right? And they've become more and more and more negative. And then there's old people that are happy and joyful and carefree, right? Because they've chosen positivity. They've chosen to not hold on to negativity, not hold on to bitterness. They've let those things go. 
And when you talk to people who are really happy, a lot of them have had really tough lives, have had tragedies and setbacks and terrible things, right? Have happened to them in the course of their life oh, that yeah. they have a reason to be bitter about, but they've chosen not to be. Right. And again, it all, it all boils down to our, what we choose to think, how we choose to think, what we choose to eat, how we choose to t take care of our bodies each day. And that's what I try to empower people to do, patients or anyone that's serious about prevention. That's what this book is all about, right? It's not about right. alternative versus conventional. Like, you know, it's not about that, right? I do help people understand the perils and pitfalls of conventional treatment so they can make a smart decision and they know what they're getting into. But beyond that, the, really the, my, my core message in the book and, and what I talk about online all the time is to give people their power back, right? So they understand their choices matter. The choices you make today affect your health tomorrow. And you can choose a path of health or you can choose a path of disease. So There's a, there is a recipe for disease and most people are following it. <laughs> wow, that's right? powerful. But you don't have to. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, wonderful. That's Thanks. all I got. Thank you, man. Thank you so much for, uh, for talking to me. And uh, Man, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time. It's great to connect. I mean, I just, yeah. I'm so glad to know you. So glad to know that you exist, like that you are doing, well, you're on you. the front lines, doing the good work, right? And, um, and helping patients one on one every day. I mean, that's right. just, and I'll tell you, what, you have a, I work with a bunch of fantastic oncologists that under uh, that recognizes um, what their limitations are, and they actually refer to us over here at the Texas Center for Lifestyle Medicine to uh, develop more of a lifestyle uh, with them and with very integrative pr protocols. So I'm very grateful and very lucky to have these oncologists that work with me as well. So hey, really man, that. that's so encouraging, right? It's yeah. encouraging that the industry is changing, doctors are changing, like people are paying attention to nutrition, and like you know who's going to benefit patients like they're going to benefit when they get a holistic approach an integrative approach functional approach right. so man now fantastic I'm excited and encouraged yeah absolutely well thank you for the interview uh, that is all for now and this is Chris Beat cancer and you can find on the Amazon the link will be put below this video so go ahead and click on that um, and uh, and check it check out what's all about I'm gonna have uh, some for my office and for my family members as well because uh, you're a very truly an inspirational person so I thank you very much so. thank you so much have a great day everybody yeah bye bye